compression. The compression transform. Thank you. Okay. Talk about uh, a few things today. Uh, I, I think some might be more interesting as an answer depending on how familiar you are with that. But I'm going to start with a very brief history of uh, neural compression. So, um, neural compression, first of all, about technology was being done in late 80s, early 90s. Uh, so, a couple of papers, but most of the work that we could say kind of started around the And Work on neural video compression started around the age which allowed some directly for neural video to happen, mostly because of the huge computational constraints that video allows to produce on us. So, what the problem is we have a lot of data and we need to keep it out and compress it in some efficient manner. And I think one of the why neural compression kind of took longer a very long time to develop is because non-neural methods have been developed in a very fast way. And in fact, uh, JPEG came out of the nineties and eighties was very hard to beat. So it was quite challenging and from the same side, many, many, many problems. So people have been trying to advance and be ever since. Now, when we compress things, how does this work? So, at the high level, uh, what we're dealing with is with some encoder, uh, some framework. Uh, you're also going to have um, a secondary set of networks which learn the distribution of. Uh, the data to be able to compress. Uh, I don't know if you put uh, anything further TCP if you wanted to, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so the point is that you have to be able to quantize uh, what comes out of the encoder. And the hyperprior in case such a thing is used, puts um, takes it as an input, uh, come up with a compressed representation itself, which when decompressed can start predicting uh, some values. Uh, in one eye, and so of course, the other does the exact opposite. So it's it's a pretty standard framework uh, these days. Now, uh, when uh, we talk about video, so what, what I just told you is about image. So when when, it, when we talk about video, however, things get very complicated uh, because we are no longer dealing with two D data. Uh, you are dealing with volumes. And when you deal with volumes, a um, number of methods that becomes available to you is increasing dramatically. So, as far as I'm aware, this one, this paper here was one of the first uh, that was doing neural video compression. And it was going through frame interpolation. So, um, say, so using methods uh, that were designed, for example, to basically. Uh, Impact of slow motion and things like this. So you use it and encode things uh, that are deviating from the prediction, basically. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward method. Now, the first so called true uh, and true video compression uh, method that lets us learn end to end is this uh, paper by Vertal uh, BBC. Uh, I highly recommend uh, looking into it if you're interested in the area because it's one of the first that it's really doing everything uh, end to end. Uh, and so, workflow is actually very similar to what I was saying in the earlier slide where we had the encoder, decoder, and hyperfire. Now, in order to go to video, uh, what Ruetal uh, did was say borrowed heavily from uh, literature in classical compression. And instead of using uh, motion uh, estimation, uh, say it used optical flow. So basically, for every consecutive frames, it can use optical flow. So it uses optical flow to warp the previous frame into the current position, computes the residual to what they want to encode, and so it uses the hyperprior method to sense the residual over. And uh, this is kind of how uh, the method looks like. Um, I would say is that something very interesting about this picture. 
So traditionally, neural networks for images and for passings did very well on slow end at low bit rates. And here is an example where it actually doesn't do well. And I think this is one of the big challenges of video compression. How do we get this slow end to be better? And let's see. So now uh, in uh, 2020, uh, my group uh, was kind of trying to see like what else could we do uh, besides this uh, relatively obvious method. And one of the things that uh, we wanted to achieve was to have a better flow estimate. And so the so way we achieved that was uh, basically to predict the confidence uh, or uh, how should I say uh, this? Uh, no, no, not, not exactly confidence, but more likely like how blurry things should be. So uh, to illustrate this problem, when, when you have a very complicated scene, like an explosion, things are flying in all directions. Uh, a pixel from this frame will almost randomly move to the next frame. So you cannot really enforce it efficiently. But if you know so if there's a problem with the region, you can say, I'm not going to actually use that. I'm going to blur the region of the frame and then I have an easier time with the interval because I didn't make a hard back. So this is a scale space flow paper which uh, Eric will send to CDPR. This was modeled down in 2021 uh, by a paper from Wave 1 which improved on it uh, by essentially encoding flow using flow. So basically, it's a condition the encoding of the current flow of the previous flow, which turns out uh, it, it does uh, yield some pretty good rate savings. And in fact, uh, I, I think as the time as this, when this paper came out, it, it was a very, very strong paper. And I think it's the first one that kind of showed that it's possible to treat uh, some of the existing uh, strong products around uh, H264, but it beats them across the bit rate range. And what was also sort of interesting was um, runtime performance, because this is critical for compression methods, especially for video. Uh, and uh, ELF, which is a reparatal method, was getting around, uh, I think, 10 frames per second. I, I don't remember exactly uh, how many, but I, I think this table is what it's trying to illustrate, which I think it was a pretty good uh, outcome given since was 2018. And since then, of course, GPUs improved in speed by significantly. But nonetheless, it was still a very big GPU uh, at the time. And this would be a challenge I want to emphasize over and over the runtime aspect. Now, this working business is something that I described in pixel space. So use the optical flow, you work for previous frame, and for the residual. So this pipeline is, is very typical. Uh, and there's a branch of research which, which kind of said, well, what if we don't do it in pixel space? What if we work in latent space? Uh, so essentially, we are looking at the output of the encoder. And this encoder produces some latent representation, which is a good degree to some number of channels. And this representation is produced for every frame. Now, one thing that one might be interested in doing is say, look at the previous frames later, look at the optical flow, how, how it maps to this later, and have a prediction for a new later based on a world version of this later. Now, <clears throat> one might be tempted to say, this is a terrible idea because uh, these latents uh, have to be high dimensional. So, for example, I think that if an image might have one ID channels, for example, which means that you can't simply move the latent around. Uh, your, your receptive field of the latent is rather large, so you kind of have to have some projections uh, at play. And I think this was one of the first papers that shows that actually it's possible to do it uh, by projecting the latents. Now, uh, most recently, uh, the EFL took this to the next level. And this is another paper I would highly recommend looking at because, as far as I understand, it is the state of the art in neural video compression. And they're also using the variant of uh, latent working. But I also would like to look at this diagram and mention that, like, when I see it, I get scared by it. 
Like I, I, I get shivers when looking at this because it's so complicated. And I, I think that you know, we compression people kind of have um, conflicting goals. One goal is to come up with something that's simple and explainable, and one is to come up with a system that's very performant in compression rates. And these are very conflicting because, as I said, this is the best paper I know for video compression today. But it is so complicated that I don't know if, for example, a graduate student is able to look at it and implement it within a year, even. So uh, it's, uh, it's a trade off. And uh, basically, this is uh, the way distortion process is quite significantly higher. That's a ripple at all the paper I mentioned earlier, which is a star. Uh, so, so there was a huge amount of progress. It's the first one I know of, which actually outperforms VPM. So it, it's I think it will be an important paper from this standpoint. Now, again, uh, say a lot of tricks uh, which are quite cumbersome to implement, uh, and this allows me to transition to the actual intended sort of as I had in mind the first time uh, I was thinking about what to present, I said so work on video compression using transformers. So as a reminder, this is the workflow we have. We have one thing. We have essentially uh, three different uh, types of encoder decoder paths: one for I frames, one for P frames, one for flow. So problem with all of it is uh, it's kind of Hard to know like what to focus on. Because ideally, when you have a complicated system and want to improve it, you'd like to pick something and say, okay, I'm going to improve this thing. But as you saw, if, if you look at this diagram and it's the best video product, there's an even higher increase in complexities than here. So their answer was, well, we're going to increase complexity, we're going to add more, more things that we're going to be doing. Um, so it's uh, definitely a valid way of approaching things, but I, I really think that from an understanding standpoint, it merits spending some time trying to come up with something simple that we can understand and perhaps improve on. So what, uh, what we did here is we looked at the basic building block, uh, which is a transformer. And the transformer is just a tool. Uh, it, it allows you to uh, ingest a sequence of data and produce a sequence of other things. Uh, in our case, what we decided to do was we're going to ingest latents and we're going to output probabilities of latents. So imagine on a language model, you'd like to predict the next word in a sentence. We are trying to predict the next latent in a sequence of latents. Now, what is super important for the rest of the uh, discussion about VCT is that actually we don't care about P or D. We don't care about the encoder as a decoder. We fix those. So actually, uh, you can take your favorite auto encoder setup, train set, and then use a transformer as I'm going to be describing, uh, and it will do compression. So it's quite good. So the exact form of P and D don't actually matter. Uh, and as a result of it, uh, what this should allow researchers is to kind of factor out the entropy modeling and see transform, see encoder, decoder path. And we also believe that uh, it should also allow more research into domain specific compression. When, for example, you might have a particular, a particular category of videos. Maybe you could adapt this as the encoder, the decoder, or the transformer to that uh, domain and see what you get. So uh, I think uh, we try to summarize these ideas in a, in a paper which is presented at NeurIPS, I believe, shortly. In response. I forget when it's new, so I'm not going to watch it. I think it's 10 days, yeah. 10 days. So uh, some of your presentations. Uh, uh, by Fabian, uh, who is the first person on the paper. Now, uh, yeah, I realized now that so you can't see here, uh, but uh, this figure uh, should show you if you could actually read it. Is that using extremely simple conceptual things that I just told you, we're able to get uh, basically 
the same results of vendors and H265. And most of the neural network methods that were published would be below H265. I believe that one paper I highlighted multiple times is better than this, but it wasn't available for us to compare when we submitted it for publication. So as you can see, you can get extremely uh, highly performant results in compression by using this very, very simple method. So let's start with the beginning. Uh, we train an autoencoder, an encoder and a decoder. Uh, ideally, we would train it with some entropy penalty, so like a variation of autoencoder. Perhaps we train it with quantization just to make sure that we have integer values that we can put as a bit string. But this is roughly the set of constraints which we might have here. And then what we do is uh, we have this sequence of symbols that comes in from the encoder, uh, we fit this into the transformer and we fit it in, term, in terms of triplets. So we feed the symbols from two frames ago, one frame ago, as a current frame. And the goal here is to predict the sequence of symbols in the current frame one by one. And the more we add decoded symbols, the more we can condition on the decoded symbols. So we can condition both on everything we decoded in the past frames and what we decoded on the current frame. Conceptually, this is what we are trying to achieve. So uh, if we are to uh, express this in, in, in terms of uh, how would we do it for a video frame, well, uh, we can't do it for a video frame, at least not directly, not without using a huge amount of RAM. So what we do in practice is we take the 1080p video frame and we split it into patches. And we can encode all of these patches in parallel. So we don't lose too much in terms of speed uh, with respect to this, but the number of autoencoding steps is greatly reduced because this is really where transformers suffer because it's an autoregressive setup. You are conditioning on what you've already decoded. So it's a sequential process. So the fewer sequential steps you have, the better off you are in terms of speed. So in this slide, in the previous slide, the XIs correspond to what? So XI is an input frame, and an XFI is a reconstructed frame. So, uh, we, so frame or, or like a pixels, patch? pixels, pixels. So, okay. So we are using it inter interchangeably uh, because actually the transformer doesn't care about pixels. It only cares about these YIs. Uh, which uh, you that essentially is the data so you can get to rearrange in whatever manner you like. And I, I will work with the example to kind of show exactly how this is done. What is yeah. the P? I mean, what is the P in your experiments are typically? What is what? The P parameter? I mean, the oh, P. Uh, I believe it was eight. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly. But yeah, if you can of course, the yeah, of course, yeah, it's also <laughs> exactly. Well, so, 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 so it was four by four. Okay. So our patches are four by four, but in latent space, and each one of the latent um, sort of coordinates uh, has a receptive of sixteen by sixteen pixels. Yeah. Yes, so we have a question. I have one clarifying question. Yeah. So, uh, when you split the video into blocks. Mm -hmm. um, so when you condition, so you condition one block to the corresponding block in the previous yes. frame, but not to the other blocks. Exactly. Yes. Okay. And to be clear, this is not strictly necessary. Uh, we just make this choice and we seem to work. But technically, you could condition on a fully decoded set of latents if you want to do it. <laughs> okay. uh, it's just an efficiency thing uh, that we thought about. So in, in here, uh, what, uh, what I'm trying to show is we would like to encode uh, a particular block. And you have conceptually the corresponding blocks from the previous frames. And the question is, how do we encode it element by element? So for the first element, we have a problem. We have no information available from the current frame, nothing. We only have two previously decoded frames. 
So we are going to only be able to condition on the previous batch, essentially, or the first symbol in, in, in the uh, batch that we are processing. Once we have one symbol that we decoded, condition solely on the previous batches, now we can condition on what we decoded. So the second symbol can be conditioned on the first decoded symbol. And um, so I'm guessing from my okay, so how does this look like? So what if uh, we wanted to take the previous two frames and say, let's predict the next frame. Let's see how, how good our predictor is, because the better the predictor is, the more efficient we are in encoding those labels. So if we condition solely on the previous two frames, the predictor um, does clearly take into account that there is motion happening, uh, but it's not able to uh, predict very well uh, what the frame is. So when looking at this predictive frame, what one might be tempted to do is to say, well, okay, we could use even this predict predicted frame uh, because for every location we'll have a mean and a standard deviation and just and use those probabilities to encode the big distance, for example. But the question is, what if we send an additional symbol? What, what if we allow the decoder to say, let's predict the next frame, but I have access to one symbol. So, uh, sorry, two symbols in this case, but I do know. Uh, so what you can see is that suddenly you have a much sharper uh, picture with just two symbols. So clearly uh, information is very valuable, even in very small quantities. And of course, uh, you know, when, when we get to more symbols available, you get very, very, very close to the actual uh, frame. Uh, so this happened in reality. So, so it shows that you have a pretty good predictive model for uh, the labels. And you can sample from it. Because also symmetries were generated by sample. So George, a quick question. So when you say n tokens per block, you are conditioning on previous n minus one decoded. Yes. Data. So for, for example, instead of uh, using uh, 16 symbols, so we decode 16, we can you decode this entire block that now gets the same one you being as expected. Uh, we are only going to use 13 instead of plus 20. And we're going to sample the most likely uh, tokens for the rest. And we're going to decode. The decoder is going to get those tokens. That's basically, the transformer can be used as a prediction model, but it can also sample from it because it has probabilities. You get that mean and a standard deviation per location. And we're assuming the Gaussian. So we just say, okay, give us a mean for the next three, for example. I, I don't actually remember, but this is exactly what we did, but very likely. So are, are you encoding these tokens with like an arithmetic code yes, under yes. this P? Yes, absolutely. So that's what we use the distributions. Uh, without the arithmetic order, you are leaving a lot of uh, information on the table, shall we say. And I think the first paper I published was trying to avoid this arithmetic order at all. I, we, I just didn't want to touch it. And I said, okay, let me predict bits directly. And it's a follow up paper with the arithmetic order. So it only lasted one, one paper. So, yes, you want an arithmetic order. That's very clear. All right. So, let's look at some. Uh, Sorry, I, I didn't. Uh, can we go back to the sure. previous slide? So, can you clarify what are these sizes? 0 kb, 0.23 kb. Like, right. Uh, so that uh, tells you how many kilobytes are being used in a particular frame in a state. So if you are can process frame by using zero blocks, sorry, zero zero tokens, it's zero. We sample everything from the model. Yeah. Uh, if we want two tokens per block, we end up with 0.13 kilobytes of the information that's so used to decode this frame. And of course, when you get to 13, you have a lot more information to work with. Okay. Oh. So, so zero tokens, that's basically the prediction. Yes, exactly. 
right? So this is what I'm saying. You can sample the problem. All right. So in order to see like how good is this model, you know, besides looking at this now it helps. I think it's good to stress test it using some potential things that it might be bad at and good at. And we look at three types of uh, transitions uh, that can happen in the world. We try to evaluate how well is this model handling itself and how well are other types of compression algorithms at handling itself. So in this case, we took one image and we translated. And on the x axis, uh, is the amount of translation that happens in a video. And um, essentially, we are looking at uh, how bad we are being coded uh, things. So we have a loss. Uh, high means bad, low means good. Uh, and ideally, we'd want to be very low on this graph, and you'd like to be flat. But in reality, because we are dealing with uh, a real environment, you know, we are going to have, as a case of scale space flow, we're going to have an optical flow estimation that could happen, uh, which might work differently uh, at high motions in 30 pixels or no motion in zero pixels. And similarly, you also have HEVC, which does motion compensation. So the point is, we are going to do worse as we have more motion. This is expected. Uh, what we sort of didn't quite expect is for DCT to have these peaks, two peaks. And we believe that those peaks happen at block boundaries. So basically, once we exceed the block boundary, we are going to have that. Um, and that's an effect of tiling. That's that we're actually tiling, and we have a pretty small tile uh, size. So again, high means bad, low means good. How do you measure amount of motion? Uh, we we know we have a frame, a static frame, and we just you know, translate it. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what happens once we have the original frame? As the next frame is translated by how much? How well will it move? That information. Um, um, does what's SSF? Scale space flow. It's uh, I, I mentioned very briefly. It's a paper we wrote in twenty twenty. CPR. It it is the traditional warp approach. But with the Gaussian sort of blurs that happens if you're not very confident. Um, so basically, if we have some kind of wrong, random motion happening at this level, it's preferable to blur, blur as a region, for example. So, uh, this method, SSF, because it has blur integrated in it, should do quite well on this task because it knows how to blur. Okay. So, uh, in terms of what exactly do we do here, is we started from a blurry frame, like the first frame was quite blurry, and then we decreased the amount of blur until we got to the original, and then we started blurring it back. So that's why you have a peak at zero. Uh, so it's a very uh, interesting phenomenon here, as it is at zero, you have a, a peak, uh, which we kind of didn't expect to happen because uh, I think at zero, it just means uh, there's no blur applied. Uh, and I, for some very bizarre reason that uh, we don't have an answer to, this is terrible at encoding, encoding static frames. Uh, for some reason, the transformer keeps wanting to predict uh, large-ish uh, standard deviations for latents, even if there's literally no change. And the hypothesis currently we have is that perhaps during training, we didn't see static videos. So the transformer is always tempted as a data set bias to spread its confidence around, which is why uh, it's actually doing quite poorly and no changes. But it's doing quite well uh, at the end. Um, and this is another example which uh, was somewhat interesting. You have two images and you cross fade from one to the other. So you don't really have motion, but you have length. It turns out the transformer is quite good at uh, blending, predicting, predicting blends. Whereas, for example, a traditional product like HEVC, this is kind of like a very remote. All right, so um, 
This is against the diagram where we have the encoder, decoder, and transform on which for these two abilities. And so, the previous one is, as I said, I think most papers can be really related to this uh, diagram on the right. The point I'm trying to make is we simplified it at all sides. Now, if you look at neural image compression, uh, which is a backbone of this uh, something very interesting has happened, which is we got better and better at doing neural image compression over time. So, uh, you have here is this graph uh, DPG, uh, which is a baseline, sorry, ADF, which is, I think it's BPG. Um, I can't read it, but I don't have my glasses. BPG. BPG. BPG, yes. So it has a baseline, which is how far away are we from BPG? And it turns out that uh, higher is better. So you want to be higher than BPG pretty much as well. As well. And we had a tremendous uh, amount of progress uh, since the field uh, kind of got revived. Um, so to such degree that right now we are basically outperforming BPM, which as far as I know is the best non-neural uh, approach. So the question is how much can we push this? There has to be a limit. Theoretically, there exists a limit. And I believe there's a paper by Ivo et al, which kind of looked at this, and I think they hypothesized there's probably, I don't know, let's say 10% that we could potentially exploit using the frameworks of today. But this is still quite a very small amount. And we'd like to revolutionize compression. So we want to get 50% you know, more of versus. So the question is, you know, how, how do we do it? And the answer is quite cheap. So instead of uh, doing uh, traditional compression where we have uh, rate distortion and trade off, we introduce a new uh, aspect into the equation, which is perception. Now, perception is a very big uh, word that probably doesn't mean anything. And we have to kind of define what it means uh, across the stock. But the point is, we try to capture like how good is this image looking for us. So let's look at an example. Uh, we have an input image, set some grass. It has a classical rate distortion trade off equation. And if you optimize for this equation, for this equation you're going to get something that is this case looks quite blurry, uh, but it is optimal from the standpoint of this loss function, which is great. It's what you want to see, right? But what if we add the realism of perception term here? Well, that's super happens if you just optimize for rate plus realism. And then I get a rate of zero and a completely different image because it's a very realistic image. It has nothing to do with what we're going for, but it has a rate of zero. So it's perfect. I think it, it did a very good job. Now, of course, it's not really useful for compression, so we kind of have to mix things. So once we add rate distortion, for example, distortion, shall here my mean this whatever. As this realism will start getting a much nicer looking image, it will have a worse PSNR, it will have a fourth means forever, so the one also at that, but it will look good. So I think this is a kind of progress that we can hope to make, where we, cheat, we, we kind of hallucinate uh, detail. And this is what we tried to do in this paper in uh, high fidelity genetic image compression, which by the way has a demo and code available if you'd like to try it. And uh, let's look at some uh, examples uh, from uh, the paper. So we zoomed in on the sweater of the girl and uh, blew up the various constructions from uh, uh, HIFIC, which is his generative compression method, and HEVC. And what you can see is that at half the bit rate, it produces some output which is very comparable visually to HEVC. So, this is a kind of progress that is not really possible to make in this level. This is why we really need to have this perception trade of who relaxes the misplay error requirement. Because we can have this type of progress. And I believe we can have even more progress than high by C. High by C is Two years old is practically obsolete 
uh, from an age standpoint, but uh, as they think it's actually a very strong baseline if you look at it visually because it produces results like this, uh, where it can synthesize the uh, wood, for example, of this work. It's not exactly the same wood, but it looks pretty good that you might not know what you're missing out. If, if you didn't have access to the original, it would look perfectly fine. Whereas a comparable uh, HEVC image, it looks like there was no wood, it looks like a plastic door, for example. So I feel like there's a lot of uh, work that remains to be done in this area in the domain of perceptual uh, compression. So in, in, in this paper, basically we ran a user study because we can't trust uh, the metrics. Uh, and of course, what we found out was actually we were getting about 50% improvement over HEDC in user studies. Now, the problem with all of it is we are reliant on user studies. This is terrible. Humans are expensive, humans are slow and not reliable. So I really think one area that our field kind of needs some direction is figuring out how to not use humans and still able to measure progress. Uh, so this takes us to the future. And I'm going to sigh. And I'm I need to apologize at this point because um, it, what, this mess we are in with PS9 is partly my fault. Uh, one of the um, early papers, and in fact, pretty much all of the early papers in mid 2010s, um, started by using PS9 RGB. Uh, and it was mostly because PS9 RGB makes sense from the standpoint that you are having RGB inputs and RGB outputs. So from this standpoint, it makes a lot of sense. But it turns out nobody is using PS9 RGB outside of neural compression. So sorry, this is terrible. We shouldn't do it. We should look at what people actually do in uh, the non-neural for the developer as it is. They track PS9 Y, CBCR. And so way differently each component in YCBCR. Now, why is this important? It's important because when you talk to non-neural compression people, when they say PS9, this is what they mean. And if you talk about 30 dB, it means completely different things. If it's RGB or this, and it's very annoying because uh, it turns out when you evaluate existing methods, neural methods with this metrics, they don't do so well. And they don't do so well because they are not trained for YUV. Uh, so one of the things that I think would be interesting is to try to have a bridge between the two areas which are kind of the joint because of this PSNR tobacco and kind of have comparable numbers in the metrics as comfortable to the compression community uh, at large. Um, and uh, as far as I'm aware, there's just one paper that does tries to make one loses wrong, and it, it's uh, it's a paper from Falcon, uh, which was doing this for video. And uh, the y axis here, uh, I believe it's RGB, and I think they have another figure with uh, y, which I forgot to copy. Uh, another thing uh, that I want to emphasize is if you want to translate those gains from uh, Images like uh, FIC to video, we need to find some way to track progress. And even if you do have a user study as yet, but it, it's still useful uh, for your own, um, shall we say, understanding. Like, how am I improving things? Am I making things better? It works. What am I doing? And we don't really have an answer here. Uh, we can only start looking at what the people from the general field modeling uh, literature are doing. And for example, uh, Imogen, Dali, Panaki, uh, whatever, there are a million papers now. Uh, we try to generate images. And what they're doing is they're measuring FID, the Fresh Inception Distance, I think, uh, on a very specific data set. And typically, when you reduce its uh, Visually, it is also kind of better. 
I, I see this track. It's not one to one mapping. We track it on click. Um, but it turns out uh, click, which is a workshop I'm organizing a CVPR for compression, has a data set on which you can measure FID. But it's too small. FID is a measure of similarity between distributions. So in order to get a good measure of set, they're completely the covariance matrix of thousands of dimensions, which means you cannot do it on, let's say, 100 images or tens of thousands of images to get uh, something good. So maybe looking into things like MS Coco, uh, that would be a good uh, starting point here. Another thing that I uh, mentioned is runtime. Um, it's unclear whether what we're developing right now is at all useful from a reliability standpoint, if it is so slow that it is not feasible. And uh, I believe um, there's no consensus on what to measure speed. Um, there have been enormous generational leaps in computation between, let's say, an NVIDIA K4 key, which some of you might remember as national history, and you know, the latest A100, or I don't even know what's the latest, H100 perhaps, um, give you from uh, NVIDIA, where we have uh, several orders of magnitude difference. But the problem is when you, when you say, okay, I'm, I'm real time on a particular Tesla if you does it mean we are done with solve compression? Or does it mean that this is completely unrealistic because you know we just measured it on a Tesla, which is a high performance computing device? So I don't have an answer. Uh, that's going to be some of the flows uh, one of the things that I want to do. I need to figure out uh, in the long term if they are going to be successful and actually used in practice. Uh, I also believe that these kinds of gains, like 50% over the best product, is kind of what everybody is looking for. Uh, because if these are not happening, then there's no hope for the field to be successful. Uh, there's been tremendous progress uh, in the most neural domain as well. So the normal compression people are making huge progress themselves. And I believe while we have some advantage right now. I believe you neural know, products are better for classical products. We need an extra 50% really or more to kind of encourage TV manufacturers to even consider putting a TPU, NPU, or whatever neural processing unit in, in, in their devices. Um, so as an example of what can be done, at least in theory, is uh, Tanaki, which I which you mentioned by name earlier. And this is one of the most extreme video compression methods if you think about it. Uh, because what it does, it looks at text, which are those lines that you see there, and it generates frames and it interpolates between those generations. So you are literally writing the script in English for a video, you're getting a video out. So it doesn't really get much better since this. So it seems to be kind of what we should aspire be able to do, but without having access to the script, basically. And of course, in terms of you know, dreams uh, that one might have, is having a codec uh, that matches VTM in real time. Uh, in case another way would be, I think this would be a nice, uh, nice dream to have for our field. It's very, very challenging, despite. As I said, D100 is, a, is an industrial GPU from you know five years ago, so it's still unfair, but we are still quite away from it, unfortunately. So it is a very ambitious goal, actually. So, and the second one is you know, how performing it by 50 percent in realism to be able to say, okay, our video looks so much better. This is the reason we want to use uh, this type of method on the TV to watch movies as opposed to classical stuff. So that's all I have. Uh, I, I, I hope I uh, raise some questions here and some potential directions that might be interesting uh, to pursue. But I, I really feel like despite being so, um, what should I say, mature on 
see image compression site, the field of neural compression is very, very early on in the video domain. I feel like that's where most of the work will be done. This is the most interesting problems will be. So if you're interested in this area, I highly encourage to look into it. But don't be scared of those super complicated diagrams that I showed you in the middle of the talk because it's possible to achieve very good results even ignoring those by removing such biases. So uh, thank you. And uh, you know, if you have questions, uh, yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think I have really come from data collection perspective, but I think that the so I, I understand when you're doing the review of the different kind of um, performance metrics, I guess um, you mentioned in terms of the time as if like to, to get a consensus. What about like basically actually reporting how many ops you need to do the compression? That's a super good uh, observation. Um, and it's making my head hurt really bad. <laughs> uh, because there are some other details, unfortunately. Uh, for example, how much memory bandwidth do you need? Yeah. Uh, you know, some of these methods might instantiate gigabytes and gigabytes worth of tensors as intermediary uh, buffers. And if you have too many of those on certain devices, especially like an iPhone, uh, you're going to have trouble because those are bandwidth limited. And even so, they might be cap capable in terms of teraflop to do real time video, let's say. They might not actually do it because the memory is a bottleneck. And there's another aspect which I believe is super interesting, as that's uh, energy consumption, uh, which kind of varies between architectures, but really that's what that true optimization goes to be how much energy you use to display to the code effect. Uh, because you know, Again, if, if your phone is maybe in your pocket because of how hot it gets, you have to increase so much energy, it's not that. Yeah, I mean, I guess just to follow up, like it, it's coming from hardware, and there's a lot of people excited to do, like, say, hardware accelerators, you know, transformers, potentially like doing this kind of injury. I guess the question is, they like, I always have trouble when I look into these different video compression algorithms to really get in a sense because. I would imagine it would be some kind of trade off between your the number of compute and versus the, the kind of compression you're able to get. And but I guess there was never like a clear trade off uh, frontier there was. Yeah. So you are completely nailing this problem, which is so frustrating. Okay, I, I, I've been going to my team and asking them to do exactly what you asked. Give me a trade off. If you compute and uh, you know compression performance, and yeah, it's not happening. And it's not happening because you have massively different architectures. So, for example, you can take one architecture, you can vary lots of parameters, and you can get this trade off. And it could be for the architectures. And some other paper comes up, and it's a completely different approach. And suddenly, everything is no longer valid because, well, maybe you get much better performance for low compute. So the question becomes now, um, okay, let's say we talk about compute. What does this mean? Is this blocks? Is this runtime? And what are they? So it becomes this never ending question and answering and changing the reports and stuff like that. It, it, it's, it's very frustrating. There's no smooth surface yet. There are just huge clusters in which you can operate, basically. But yeah, it's, it's I I am very well frustrated by this. Any other questions from the audience or um, anyone on Zoom? Yeah. So one question: So you use the transformer model. Essentially, it's a lossless compressor mm -hmm. for those reasons for every frame, exactly. and it's doing a very. I mean, it seems like and based on the curve, it's doing a very great job at that. I'm just wondering whether, I mean, using up prism transformers for this lossless compression was just based on, we know that they do well on the, in the NLP or all these literatures, so let's try to use this framework, or did you also consider some other architectures for this, like a lossless and entropy so estimation? Before we had transformers, uh, we looked at RNNs, for example, uh, but unfortunately, RNNs are like LSDMs, so, um, very outclassed by transformers yeah. uh, these days. So 
we gave up very early. Uh, and we, we basically told this plan, you know, a few days as it is. And so um, it's the first time somebody touched the transform on the double so transform was okay. Transform as it is. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, on, on the hardware angle, like I think it's super important to have hardware optimized for transformers because, for example, one of the key uh, problems transformers have are these gather operations where you kind of need to look at different rotations from previous uh, points in the video, and the same with, for example, warping. So that access a lot of work to be done in optimizing. Accelerators for these methods. And once that is done, I think it might actually be possible to use this in a, in a video for that. But as we are right now, I don't think it is. A lot more work needs to be done in the hardware. And yeah, the British, I think, I mean, the approach is quite interesting because, as you said, like it extremely simplifies whatever. I mean, you can just take the same architecture and modify it for, say, D frames or any exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. Can you comment a little bit on how hard or easy it was to like train this? Um, like, yeah, I think I, mean, I didn't do it, but then did it. So, if you catch him by the very fast, the more, but uh, it, uh, it went like this great excitement. We got the model train, okay. Then, uh, we started accumulating more and more authors to the paper because uh, we needed more tricks and more tricks and more tricks uh, to get it to play properly. So uh, transformers seem to be kind of like black magic, like you know, you look at you know so diagram. Okay, I'm implementing it. Okay, it's one to one. It matches perfect. And you run it. Okay, maybe you get something. You get lucky. I think Bobby was lucky the first time. But said he couldn't do pump up the performance. So he he hit the wall. He didn't know what to do. And all kinds of small tricks like did we initialize this? Like, did you do that? Did you, I don't know, this small scale? It doesn't matter. So, um, I, I feel like somebody could write a book about how we can transform our property. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. So, yes. The um, rate distortion perception yes. framework, are you concerned that it might? In some applications, it, it, in a sense, it's kind of making up stuff. It is. <laughs> right. And so I, I could imagine it being used in, in some context, it, it being very useful and benevolent. But but let's say people use it in the context of medical diagnostics. It could be really dangerous. Well, uh, as a teacher, we have a CVD paper in submission which will address this. Uh, I, I don't know if I should get money test because of the ban on information security is imposing, but uh, basically it's possible to address. And I think there are many ways to address it. And I think we are just thinking about one. So if you happen to see one paper, it might not be ours. <laughs> there are many ways which I already discussed with some people and said we could be doing it. So many ways. So that's the word. Uh, it is possible to address very nice. So this has nothing to worry. Uh, hopefully, no zeros dreaming uh, to uh, relax. And with regard to your your challenge or question on you know some sort of a metric that captures or correlates well with human satisfaction and, and perception, do you feel like there's room for more directly thinking about the, the neuroscience of it, like maybe doing studies that oh, you know will have EEG data <laughs> and somehow. I feel like Johannes should be answering this question, uh, Johannes Bennett, because I think he was very much interested in what uh, what we're saying. Um, and I think he has uh, at least one metric which was inspired from neuroscience uh, and NLP, I think. Um, but honestly, I, I think besides the sort of general framework to think about, on how to think about it, uh, so studies would be very challenging to design because 
if it's a neural network, for example, of course, we need a lot of training data. So you mean a biological? A biological, yes. So I, it, what, what I'm saying is like, it, it gets so complicated because I remember there are some, there's some work which, for example, try to reverse and engineer an image from various signals on the cortex. Right? Mm -hmm. So if if you can get this type of data, I think that would be the ultimate way of designing uh, yeah. perceptual or whatever. But the point is, it, it's so difficult to do it so that I don't know, I, I don't think it would have a guess there. But we can think of different models and maybe the two source might be one of them. I have one more question. So you talked about PSNR, LGB, and YUV, yes. um, or YCBCI. Yes. Um, just a general question, like if you train your models for, let's say, PSNR, YCBCR, do the end results look perceptually more pleasing at the same, like, rate distortion? I'm curious, just... What's the top count here? <laughs> I will ask you all these hard questions. So, uh, you know... It's a very, very tough question what we are asking because we never have a study, uh, but we definitely did train the model. And what I remember happening was we didn't look any better. So, uh, so it's counterintuitive because pretty much everybody uh, is saying, okay, well, if you drop the chroma, you're not gonna get any rate for Y. So it should look better. Uh, but we never looked, look, maybe I should have consulted on from at least, I'm not sure. But uh, we, we never had a study, so maybe we should try to have a study. It's not that hard, but uh, we just change the loss function. Um, but I, I cannot really explain. I, for example, if you look at the graph, the Y, yes, not Y, was that I retired to a certain model. But visually, like, I, I, I couldn't say, okay, this is definitely better, or it's just very subtly better. It was kind of identical to the mean square error model in MTB. And again, maybe it's tied to a particular architecture choice we made. I don't know. Because, for example, on the generative uh, side of things, um, it turns out that the design, the architecture design of people, so if you use the wrong network, uh, you might not be capable enough to generate some detail. So maybe in this case, there are a case, maybe we didn't use the right encoder or the right encoder to make use of this fact that we could get away with better detail in mind. So it's a complicated study. But like in, in the study, like that would automatically, like are you doing some Chroma subsampling as well when you're running these studies. Like if you do that, that will automatically get accounted for. This is a tough, tough now because mm -hmm. yes, of course, we tried running chroma yeah. subsampling, not running it. We tried explicit scaling, we tried learned scaling, learned downsampling, learned upsampling. Like there are so many variants that my head was just thinking about the different things we tried. And it was so frustrating because like, yes, we're gonna have a paper out of this. This is gonna be amazing. Spend half a year. Nothing. Do you still have those results somewhere so people don't test? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe it's more interesting now, but as a time, you know, we were trying to say, okay, we can beat traditional codex and stuff like this. And it, it wasn't really useful to just have very. And by the way, the difference in PSN and Y wasn't crazy high, it was quite small. Mm. In fact, it was disappointingly small. So the hypothesis which we have, and we still have, is that the first layer of these neural networks are actually learning a transform, which in essence does some kind of downsampling in the chroma space, but it's learning the chroma. Cool, uh, I think we can thank this speaker again. Thank you very much. And I have to say that I feel like this 